All right, so we do have our engine for station three, engine 123. This is the Aero XT. We're going to go through the operation for actually lifting the cab. We have Engineer Kaplan that's going to go over that operation for us. So with the battery on, uh, we're going to uh, switch the lever from a lower to a raise. I'm going to identify that I'm going to tilt the cab so that no one's around uh, and can get hit by it. Raising the cab. I'm going to raise the toggle switch to activate. The cab will raise. All right, we're here with Victor. He's our head mechanic and trainer for the Vista Fire Department and whenever it comes to our engines. And so, what are we going to be doing today, Victor? Today we'll go through the basics of what should be covered during a daily pre-trip on the engine. Uh, basically, really is a commercial vehicle other than it has some uh, exemptions because it is a life-saving piece of equipment. But in the end, it's still a commercial truck that should be checked so all your safety implements just as if it were a commercial truck and so we'll go over all the fundamentals of braking steering what you should be looking for what type of things that could indicate a problem uh, as well as issues with the engine and we can go down the powertrain pump stuff like that and uh, hit all the points that we need awesome thank you all right uh, so basically drop the cab down until you can't accidentally lock the safety prop out of position and that's why uh, so guys will grab it that. just enough to catch it you can not take it out just by bumping it so you can accidentally come through here in a rush or something the prop falls down okay, and it's not in place so you don't realize it um, so it's just once you get it down make sure you have clearance between the safety prop and the cab structure grab the stop make sure it can't come out easily and then you're good all right so um, begin most of the time what I teach everybody including our drivers for our shop at our facility is the biggest thing is come to the front of the truck or the bottom take a glance underneath the truck make sure you don't see anything on the ground that wasn't there uh, bolts oil coolant uh, any other fluids that may have been uh, leaking over time or all of a sudden sunny because many times you can come in and all of a sudden have a pinhole start to leak and then all of a sudden it starts peeking on the ground and you come back out also you have this mess. So having the habit of coming out and taking a glance underneath the truck, other than obviously pump packing, something like that, um, that's a, a kind of a normal thing to see if you don't have a mechanical seat or something like that. Because a glance on the truck, you look for anything that's odd. Um, other than that, is starting at any point from the front of the truck and coming back. Um, I tell guys to develop a routine that you're comfortable with that helps you remember all your key points. There's not a start A, B, C, and D, so you need to do it in this order. There isn't a reason to do it in a particular order. There is a reason to do an order to help you remember. So every operator should have their own routine, if you will, so they can remember to, that they're confident that they will hit all the points to check everything on the truck. So uh, obviously underneath, typically what I'll do is do a visual of the outside of the truck. Uh, lights and stuff like that, um, but it's again, however you guys proceed to do that sequence. Other than that is the big ones, tires. Come to the tires. Do I have any damage to the side of the tire, top of the tread, or inside part of the tire? Damages that could be potentially uh, hazard. Any cut in the sidewall that is a significant depth that you can feel or see cord, automatic out of service. Any cut that we see, usually if it's gouged enough, we don't play with it. It's an automatic out of service. Uh, if it's relatively low, you can feel, uh, see it, but you can't see cords. Take a blunt, not sharp, uh, screwdriver, small bucket, run it in there, and make sure that you can't touch cord. If it's really deep, though, even if you can't see it, uh, cord or feel it, if it's significant. We don't like to play with that. Type. It's usually it's out of service. Um, tread depth there are specific uh, dimensions for tread depth on the front versus yes. the rear front is uh, 4 30 seconds across the tire not at typically the edge there's another criteria there 
rears are 2 seconds. Uh, the engines and ambulances do have a characteristic of wearing the inner tire more than the outer tire, so it's imperative that the inner dual is checked as well, if anything, more than any of them. Uh, some of our trucks like this that have the independent suspension, we take particular close attention to the edge. We do have more of a rounded edge wear pattern normally, so you really want to keep an eye out in here. An indicator you'll find on a lot of the brands, not all of them have them. They'll either have a triangle, Michelin likes to put the Michelin man there. Uh, this is indicator tells you where the tread wear indicator on the tire is. Tread wear indicators will always go across the tread, never in line with the tread. Because okay. it's measuring across the width of the tire, have an indication of the whole tire as far as how it wears. So it has to be down about right there. Uh, I wouldn't use this here because this is really, uh, most of the time is just a cosmetic oh, okay. thing that they do. The but no, yeah, that's just coincidental. It could be here. Some of the other brands that we use, um, you'll just see a triangle shape gotcha. here. And it doesn't coincide with this, that it coincides with the tread wear indicator, it's in the tread. Um, don't measure tread at the indicator, at the valid deepest point. And what you want to do is a point, three separate points on a different area of the tire to get an average. So rear, same thing. Okay. You'll see the same thing. It's on some of the treads we have, you'll see rubber in the little rubber thingies inside the tread. That's the stone ejector. That is not to be used as a tread indicator. It's a very common mistake. Just these little nubs inside the here that go with the tire. When you're here, take a look at your wheel. Um, indications of a loose lug nut. These are just a chrome cap. If you have to, pull it off. This aluminum, uh, typically you'll look for rust, streaking, stuff like that. Aluminum wheels don't rust, so you're not going to see rust. What you're going to see is basically aluminum that's kind of oozing. It's called galling. It's oozing out of the rim. That means that this lug nut is moving and squishing like clay, the aluminum out of it. You start seeing that, uh, and it's usually pretty bright and fresh. It indicates that the lug nut or the wheel is actually moving on the hub. It's rounding the aluminum wheel, basically. Correct. So, but you do want to look for rust or streaking on the lug nuts. It's bright and orange. Dark, red, dirty is old. It's okay. just rust on the surface. It's not doing anything. Active looseness or cracking is a bright orange right. rust that you'll see coming out. An indication like that, looking for holes between the lug nuts, lug nuts to the wheel hole for the ventilation, between the two here, anywhere on the wheel surface. Any kind of indication or crack or anything like that. Um, other surface damage, did it hit a curb? Is this lip bent over a lot? There is an allowable amount of damage to the lip. It is very minimal, but the biggest reason for that is these tires on commercial trucks do not have a safety. So a significant amount of damage to the rim can cause a tire failure. So we don't really... For tire coming off the beat. Yes, because there's uh, you have a deflection, so it creates a tension spot. So if under normal driving, that can actually flex the tire enough to give air to pass out, and actually just poof, it'll waft out and uh, the tire will lose all this pressure. Um, so following that from there, Looking at the hub, same thing. It's indications of severe leaking. Moisture like this, what we would call like a class one, or weeping or wetness, is pretty normal. You're gonna see that. It's just uh, oozing from there. It's very light. It's, it's just wet enough to collect dirt. Not an indication of a big problem. It's pretty normal. Um, that's average. Wetness around the window, which can happen. Many times it's the plug weeping. If you look in here, there's an indicator for oil level. Um, sometimes a window like this is dark, they make them tinted. Yeah, we don't really care for it. Just take the plug out, look in there. You can see the oil re reasonably in here, you're good. Put your finger in there if you can touch it. Average is pretty good, you'll be fine. Um, I didn't even know that thing came off. Yep, just pops on like that. <laughs> you get a rag, we'll clean it off. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of little things, you know, but usually it's, I can see it, what you can do, you guys have a flashlight? Uh, yeah, I do. On you? There's another thing, so you don't have to take your hand in there, so you can, thanks for that. Is, anytime that you put the flashlight right in here, it'll kind of brighten it up and you'll see the dark line. Okay. So you don't have to actually take the, you know, this stuff's everywhere, it's pretty stinky. <laughs> you know, it's 
especially in the summer. Man, I really smell that stuff, you know? <laughs> You get streaking across the rim. I can get one out of the surface. Look at You can shine it kind of above, and you can kind of see it. The other ones, it is a lot easier to, to see where it's at. This yeah, one so is this pretty, pretty, pretty tough, difficult. You know, but you uh, see the indicator lines and stuff on there. Yeah, it's, it's kind of tough. Yeah, I can kind of see it right there. But they, Pierce was already tinted the damn things. Yeah, why would you tint that? You know, <laughs> when we replace them, we put clear ones in them right. for that reason. But again, not a big deal. Take this bad boy off, pop it. Oh, there it is. Okay. You know, take it there. Damage the wheels, stuff like that, looseness. From there, what I usually do is I'll carry it out from the tires coming to the inside. Okay. Start looking at the suspension component, whether it's a spring, leaf spring, straight axle, uh, tack four in this case. And basically, what you're going to is, you can see it, put your hands on it, check it out, talk about it, inspect it. Obviously, you can't check the ends of that motor. You do your best, check the oil and all the vitals. But, come in here, make sure your hoses, physically put your hands on it. Check them for looseness, or not looseness, but um, cracking, or the looseness, yes, yeah, the fitting all of a sudden swiveling, it shouldn't be moving. Okay. So it's, you'll get a leak when you apply. Make sure your caliper's there, obviously. It's not falling off bolts. Look for indications of looseness, rust, you know, frayed paint, stuff like that's a good indicator. Look at the arm. Hide it right here. You know, look at the arm or spring or axle and look for indications of loose. This is usually greased. These are uh, usually pretty clean for the most part, but you'll see this. this that's just the residue from the grease doing its thing. You know, looking for all that. Look at the bracketry, make sure that everything's okay. You don't look like any cracking. All of a sudden, you'll be fresh paint flickering off because usually something's moving. You know, and just follow a path from this down around in a way that you can just kind of a, a routine flow pattern of, of checking everything from the suspension to uh, the spindle, springs, steering boxes, what have you. On the brakes, um, our older trucks have uh, disc brakes, drum brake combinations. The older style actually has a physical slack adjuster. So those are the ones where you take a measurement. Uh, 100 p 90 to 100 PSI on the reservoir, operator on the seat. Uh, flows a full application with the wheels, chocks, and the park brakes release like as if you're gonna ready to go. Mm -hmm. Full application on the floor, you take a measurement. Unfortunately, we don't have that here today on this truck, so I can't really demonstrate it. But on this truck, with these internal slacks, they still have slack adjusters. They're just inside the caliper, so there's no measurement to take. You see, it's bolted directly to the caliper. You don't have a physical lever and plunger that you can see. So basically, it's, it's, you're gonna try and your best, see if there's any problems. There's some indicators, like right this little guy. We don't expect you guys to take this off. On these tack fours, independent or the we just call them slackless, but they are slack. Is you're gonna notice that this thing's pulling. The biggest indicator is when you go to stop, this thing wants to go one way or the other when you hit the brakes. Then there's something going on. We do a very thorough inspection of the brakes when they come in for service. If you suspect any kind of a handling problem, call us we come and double check the brakes and stuff. On the trucks that do have slacks, there's a measurement of um, typically anywhere from inch and a half to inch and seven eighths. It's just not to exceed two inches on the brakes strip. That's front and back. These new ones don't have it, so there's you don't really measure it. Yeah. So in the case where you put the parking brake as well and it just doesn't want to hold, then there's something out of whack. Gotcha. So I'm trying to like say carry on from there. Frame. If you're looking at your frame, that's why we have these also painted red because it's easier to see problems. Cracks look like versus the black. So everything, hangers, bolts, battery mounts, all that, make sure it's all good to go. Cab lift, make sure you're not getting a big old thing of oil coming out of the cab lift cylinders. And, you know, there's the lift. This shaft here is the steering, you know, uh, steering linkage from the inside, from the steering wheel steering column down to a miter box, which changes the direction of this rotation of the steering. Could you mind pointing here. out those things? Yeah. So, just for identification. Once a 
person gets in the routine for a pre-trip, a good pre-trip, taking maybe 20 minutes. Okay. When we're instructed in a pre-trip, an hour. instruction can take you an hour, hour and a half because <laughs> you're talking about everything. So we go from the wheel end, this truck has the gearboxes and underneath the frame. And like I say, you take visual and things loose, bolts, leaking hoses, um, anything like that, cracking frame. You follow that up from, this is the shaft from your steering column, from the steering wheel to tell the steering boxes which way you want to go. So you just take this, get your hand on it, you know, make sure it's not loose like that. Make sure there's not a bunch of play. Uh, bolts aren't missing. Follow it up through here. This is the miter box, which is the 90 degree change of direction. Basically takes the steering column and makes it change, makes a hard 90 or wherever you need it to go. And then you can see that in there. You can rotate it a little bit, but not much. But basically it's making sure when you grab it, stuff aren't falling off, fall up in there. You know, it's tough to get your hand in there. So that play, you just kind of feel it from the steering wheel. So you would repeat this process on the other side. We won't go through the whole thing because it's the same thing. Right. Okay, same thing, brakes, tire wear, stuff like that. Um, same thing in the back, you would go to the back and underneath, look at leaf springs, anchors, brake hoses that they're not rubbing or cracked or anything like that. Visual the whole rent, it's not puking oil from underneath. You know, there's nothing jammed in there, it looks like it's gonna fall off, all that kind of stuff. Again, you don't have to screw in every single square inch with a magnifying glass, but a good glance as an operator to look at things that just do not look normal, look out of place, look like they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. Come back to the front of the motor. Um, when you have the cab on, you can do a visual of the front grill area, main thing you're not full of garbage and debris, brush, especially if you guys have gone into any of the rural areas. Any of the lead foliage it just gets sucked up because the fan does pull quite a bit of air, so it could suck in a lot of uh, debris and actually clog up the radiator. Um, in shop, typically we're trying to uh, blow all that out, make sure it's clear and the normal services, but it does occur, especially you guys having to go somewhere like that and get off the road or a road that has a lot of overgrown and it's all on the road. You want to take a good look at it and do the pre um, So, that being said, the cab's up. Similar thing. Take a good look in the um, eyeball the inside surface of the radiator. See if you see any kind of uh, physical liquid leaking or any residual dried up evidence, which is usually, depending on the vehicle, could be from a white crustiness to a pink, red, or orange crust buildup. And you'll usually see a trail coming in from the, the radiator coming down any of these areas, top of the tank. It's just a good area that, to check for any kind of leakage or something like that or some problem with the radiator. Um, and again, it's like a flow of movement from there. Hoses, this is the air intake for the compressor. Your AC compressors right here. Uh, typically you look for here, so you're not gonna look for refrigerant, which is possible. If you have a total failure, see the white hissing cold frozen area yeah, from the okay. refrigerant but for the most part you're gonna see is uh, oil leakage stuff like that you know follow the hose make sure it's not puking oil it's not rubbing against something physically make sure it's not flopping around where it's gonna hit something that's spinning like fan this is the intake on the engine side after the intercooler it's on the front of the radiator this is after the air from the, the turbo has been cooled down coming into the engine look for holes in this boot any of the couplings are loose, the clamp is broken or missing. Again, you can put your hand on it, make sure it's not just sitting there. And then visual issues of the motor, hose are leaking something around the area. Uh, the big one is for us and fire is any fuel leak on an apparatus is an out of service criteria. If there's a physical drip from the fuel system on an apparatus, it's an out of service. It has to be dealt with immediately. That's a type three. How's it class class three? Uh, well, fluids typically are three classifications. Type one, which is kind of like the wheels, it's wet enough to collect dirt, is a class or type one class one leak. Class two, where it actually can form a droplet, but it's not actively dripping. That would be a class two because it's accumulating over time and forming a drop. Class three is when the unit is in service and operating, you physically see a drop. Okay. Occurring. That's out, out of service. Of out of service. Okay. And fuel. Two is out of service. 
everything else, a three. Coolant, we do a little bit tight as well. We don't like to see drips at all. Mm -hmm. So that we kind of do it along with the uh, fuel, not necessarily out of service, but we need to do something about it to make sure it doesn't become a problem. Uh, like I said, this is the air compressor for the air brake system, the compressor itself, the governor, which regulates when the compressor kicks on and off for uh, regulating the pressure reservoir and all the air tanks. Uh, this is air coming in. This is the Hose for power steering to supply the pump for your steering, which comes right here. You have your power steering reservoir, which is nicely labeled. Eventually, the sticker wears off. <laughs> and then um, the feed and return. A lot of times, we'll get a leaks in these areas, which is not too big a deal. We'll just take care of it. If it's not puking, uh, if it's just wet, it's, it's okay. Um, but do make note of these things. Um, the one thing with the power steering is very common is this cap gets over tightened. Make sure it's one, it stays in place, it's there, because they do sometimes go missing. And it's not from operator, it's um, some of the apparatus, what happens is the cap, the rubber grommet is defective and it won't hold it. And in some cases there's a problem in the power steering system where it's actually building pressure. And all of a sudden it'll go poop, it'll pop it. OES was the one that did it for many years. It was, uh, there was a defect in the pump and the, the indicator was that they kept losing, the, and that's why they're cabled now. And it will pop it and then come back from the point. It's like, where's the it? dips? It? It's probably um, five <laughs> somewhere. Yeah. And so, Somebody's tired. And like I said, look from here, oil leaks. Your diesels always have some sort of weepage. I mean, you can already see a little bit in this area, just cracks and stuff. That is pretty normal. The class one around this engine is going to occur. But you start getting a threes, twos, it's something needs to be addressed. Let's do a visual. Where is it coming? Where is it there? It's coming through here. Uh, is it getting anywhere that potentially, like on the other, when we go to the other side, are we actually getting oil on the turbo? That is a very high concern because the oil will, could ignite. You know, uh, the turbo gets very hot. A lot of times guys are not aware of how that thing, if you could watch it. Nighttime is a very good indicator. It'd be great after you're pumping. Watch that thing blow. Look underneath it, like that 1100 thing is degrees or well, something like that. Orange. On my truck when I'm pulling grades, I'll hit I'll hit 900. Yeah, the turbo degrees. itself will be more than that. Yeah, because the regen itself is a uh, thousand. You know, that's just no load really. But with a load, you'll it. you'll exceed that. That thing will be orange. This unit happens to have a 4000 uh, EV, which is specific to the emergency. Um, We'll check the back of the engine. You've got your transmission dips, our engine dips, excuse me, transmission fill, engine fill here. Most of our apparatus don't have a transmission dipstick as the new ones are coming through because they're going away from it, kind of. Um, they use an electronic oil check, uh, which is actually pretty accurate. We can go through that. It's not on some of us, but this is engine oil, engine fill. But this actually, excuse me, some of them don't. But some have a built in. So this is both the fill and the dipstick. So important thing is checking the transmission. These be running. And I'd be sitting here idle. Because what happens is the torque converter is a giant tank of oil. Mm -hmm. When you shut it off, it starts draining back into the engine, the transmission case. So the level will climb. Uh, we'll go through when we can get in the cab how to check the oil that. Engine running, there's two indicators on the transmission dipstick. When you take it out. So we have an indicator, cold, low, and full when it's cold. Thank you, Darren. And then the range jumps when the training is up to temperature, which typically the engine engine temperature as well. It'll go from hot add to hot full. So transmissions, uh, they have a lot of expansion. The engine doesn't really do the same thing. What is a typical transmission temperature on all of these Allison transmissions? We have, we have, there's several different ones, but I mean, they're all typically one it's Allison really, trans. Yeah, so I'd we imagine. have three in our fleet, three models. Three models. Is it the Allison two. World? The, well, the World is the generation, and that spans several generations. The World is this design here. Um, we don't have any more of the older ones that are non-world, which would have been the back okay. series of Allison's. Uh, 
Transmission temperature, if you're at engine temp, which is in zone, you're good. But anywhere from 150 to 220 okay. is pretty normal. You start hitting 250s and starting climbing, there's a concern. Something's not right. Um, and sometimes we don't find them until we're pump testing because there's a load, a consistent, constant load, and the slippage is small, but it, it's long enough to generate an increase in temperature, and we can we see it in the gauges when we do the testing, and we found actually trainings that worn out that nobody could tell because they didn't drive any different. They yeah. didn't slip. Temperatures didn't long, run it long enough because you're not going over the road to get hot, but under pump testing with no wear, under full you know load we found the, the problem there and we actually had the transmission to go um, so but on average 140s 180s uh even the twos 205s even as high as 220 because that's usually where the engine cooling is and it starts kicking to cool it down it should fluctuate in there these things when they're doing good average is 150 to 180 they don't like don't really go very much higher um, other than that we start really paying attention to something's not right if you start seeing above 250, pull the thing over. All right. so pull it over, let it idle, let it cool down. Um, you gotta take a break. So it could be anywhere from 10, half an hour, depending on the truck. So pull over, let it down. It'll probably take you 10 miles, you'll get right back to temp. That happened to me with a truck that had a rebuild and there was a problem in the case and that we had to, by the time we were coming back, they were closed. So it was, we were point of the, past the point of no return to go back. So we just brought it back to stop and wait till the next day and then had a towed so but on this side carry on you got your battery box here most of our, our apparatus have five to six batteries average um, we go to the, the DGMs um, so checking cables you don't physically have to put a wrench on them all you really need is grab them make sure that they're not frayed they don't have a bunch of green stuff on them they're oxide because that means there's corrosion happening inside the copper and then just grab the terminals, just give it a little wiggle. You don't have to pull those off. If it moves, it's loose. And it's enough that sometimes even that looseness can cause the truck not to start. Um, grab each one, just take a visual. If you see a bunch of oxidation, don't really touch it. If you want to, um, just call us, we'll come back out. After you see a big old cauliflower thing right here, then <laughs> there's some max, some leakage. It's, it is sulfuric acid. Um, it'll, at the minimum, will tear holes in your clothes. And then, Get some chemical burns, you don't want to avoid that stuff. But like I said, um, just a little wiggle if they're clean, pick them out. If there's no bulging in there, make sure the cable's secured, check all this stuff. That's all you really got to do. Okay, everything's good. The batteries aren't expanded because they're overcharging or blowing up physically. Um, after a run, what you can do is uh, some of them is just put your hand on it. If it's not room temperature or from the engine exhaust heat mm -hmm. and it's just one battery usually the problem is the problem with that battery but usually the all the battery bank will be consistent you just put your hand on it they feel the same and all the temperature is the same it's probably because of the engine but if you have cold cold hot that battery something's going on with it. stuff like that or it just looks bloated you know something like yeah, that it's bloated swollen. it's swollen some problem call us out we'll come get it we keep the batteries for these trucks on hand um Carry on there. This is your dryer. Make sure it's not falling off, break loose hoses. You're not leaks coming from here. You don't have to get a spray bottle and hose it. Just listen for it, check it. These are your um, cab latches. Make sure you don't have, uh, you will get a little bit of uh, oil. Uh, like the class one, just kind of moist. Mm -hmm. For the most part, they stay pretty clean, but uh, make sure you don't have any leaking coming on here because that's. The, this pressure is in direct relationship to the rams. So what happens is when you hit the lift switch to lift the cab, that fills this up with oil to pull the locking pin out. And once the locking pin bottoms out, that pressure then goes to the rams and lifts the cab. So if this guy leaks, we got leaks coming out of here or in here. Any leak in here, we need to know about it. We usually keep these on hand. Um, it's a little bit of a process, but typically, many times we can change them out in the field. Oh, cool. Now our pierces that we have, the last generations that we purchased, have the TAC-4 independent suspension. These are the components of the torsion bar, which is basically the spring, the giant spring that holds the weight of this truck. These are the torsion arms. 
that hold the tension and transmit it into the arm to maintain ride line. This is the physical torsion bar. This should never be stood on, pried on, used for an anchor point or nothing. This is a piece of spring material that's under extreme high tension. These have a rough coating. It's a uh, like a Linex to protect it okay. from corrosion. Not a huge issue out here, um, but some cities like San Diego, there was the salt air. Uh, they have experienced that problem. So the thing is, we avoid anybody stay, stand on it, use it for whatever. If you nick the surface, we have to take care of it immediately because if it starts to rust, that can, creates a stress rise in the portion bar and that's what it'll break. And this breaks, it's not a small pop, it's a huge bang and the truck is on the ground. So um, that's, a, that's a big one. Keep really good clothes. If something fell down or something's rubbing on it and it rubbed under the metal, yeah, we need to address, address that immediately. Come to the Correct. This is the big spring. Yeah. Is the leaf spring is just in a twisting motion. Basically take a coil and straighten it out. Mm -hmm. This is the exact same thing. It's just straight instead of coil. I've had those the same thing on trucks. And yep. So that, the biggest one, don't stand on it. Don't step on it. Don't put something on it. Don't tie off to it. <laughs> you know, because that anchor is... Point. So anchor that point. thing, it, so... It's working and operating because it has some sort of rotational force, which comes back into here. That's correct. So and so, this essentially is, and that's rotating and, and turning this portion right, right here. It sets an anchor point for the torsion bar. Okay. And when you, they adjust the screw and shorten it and bring it in, it in turn twists the torsion bar in its relative direction to basically twist the control arm in the direction it needs to essentially lift the truck okay so when it's set it's the fixed point as as you're driving this arm is rotating up and down right it's twisting the, the torsion bar to act as a spring okay so all right it's a extreme amount of tension oh cool in there so very dangerous so if there's something that's kind of weird going on you should know about it right away if it's like nicking it um you want to take care of it way to avoid those things to break do they occasionally break on their own yeah they do Nothing that you could have avoided. Uh, mostly the concerns have been with uh, areas with a lot of corrosion problems. Snow, salty roads, uh, beach areas. Um, that issue. All our other trucks are leaf spring, simple design, very simple. Drives more like a truck. You know, but uh, same things you want to look for rust, anything like that. Um, so anytime you guys want to change direction or whatever you tell me well like i said i'll be here all day <laughs> no that's fine that's good <laughs> yeah. this is actually gonna be a good video you know, yeah um, yeah so yeah, what you hear is specific to you guys is look at your plumbing your, you know your discharges today this one's about to split you know look at this for cracking or it's rubbing somewhere mm -hmm. you know grab a hit of the bracket's broken shoot you know it's visual Take a look at it. It's your, your equipment. It's something that you use. Our guys don't see it because they don't have that stuff. So for them, it's just they're getting a license and they just need to drive. But for you guys, this is a giant work truck. There's a lot of stuff that has very specific things to do. So that adds kind of your plate as an operator to check those added things, you know, visual. You know, this swivel's about the bolt's missing. Mm -hmm. And now that you guys charge that line, that's going to go. It's not going to really do anything to anyone because it's covered by the body, but the person on the line that needs that water is not going to get it. So as the operator, to check those components that these things are clamped, everything's nice and tight, I don't see any rust, and nowadays they're all stainless, so you're not going to have that problem anymore. Um, like, you know, these right here, the generically called a Victaulic coupler, but it's actually called a group coupling, Victaulic is the brand, but everybody knows it is Victaulic, so the bolt will be gone or broken. That coupling is uh, subject to failure. So it's a visual to check that stuff as well. To help you guys on, on the line, wherever you guys are doing. So it's carrying up through here. Again, just following through. Right here is, uh, as uh, Derek pointed out, is the cab lift pump. This is the electric hydraulic power to lift the cab. Uh, everything should be automated. On these trucks, the ignition on, power on function switch on the opposite side but uh, if you do have an electrical failure pump failure or uh, some sort of mechanical failure with the, the pump that does the cab lift you do on these trucks most of ours we do have a couple in the fleet that don't have it this does have a mechanical override which basically is just like a bottle jack that you'd have in your arbor store 
functions the same. You take your handle from the cab, and I think it's the cab. There's a hole here, and you insert it through here. Uh, the guy's grabbing the handle now, and this just functions like this. But we'll grab the handle to demonstrate it. So, typically this handle is, if it's not behind the cab, well, I think the set thing is actually right next to the pump under the bumper. Mm -hmm. um, and the other ones, I'm, I, to be honest, I don't remember where the rest of them are. I couldn't find one on the, I believe it was the dash. I couldn't find one. I don't one. think 44 even has an override. Okay. So we do, it is optional. Don't die. So. Um, <laughs> it's running out of battery, yeah. <laughs> so you let me know. So I can put my take your handle. You there is a bleeder to let the cab down. You want to make sure that is tight. It's underneath here. It's just a little T bolt. Flip that on there because the end of the handle has the notch for it. Put it on that piece there. Make sure it is snug. You don't have to crank it, just make sure it's tight because you can actually damage it. So then. Right here. You take the T, install it here, you can crack it to loosen it counterclockwise to let the cab down, clockwise to tighten and just snug it down to, to uh, make sure the fluid will go to raise the cab. Take the handle, install it in here, and then you're going to just start pumping. Um, I'm not going to go through the motions all the way because we do have the cab up now. but. It takes a lot of pumps to get this cab. As we found out, it, it uh, was <laughs> yes. cumbersome to, it's probably to get about it out. 20 to 50, depending on the truck, before it even starts moving. Yeah. I think I counted, if not 450, 500 before I got the cab of this truck. <laughs> the stuff been up because of the better connection. They put a fuse in there that was. Is that the initiation for the new mechanic? Yeah, well, unfortunately, that was me. <laughs> so, once you're done, same thing. Uh, make sure you have spotters. And especially when you come down, nobody's in the way, and you're getting down, you're clear. Make sure they clear of where the cab is going to come down. Especially, we'll get used to putting our hands over somewhere. Make sure you're clear. Area of the inside of the truck. Again, it's a sweeping glance. What you're doing is you're following a path up and over. Exhaust, exhaust, significant exhaust leaks are not a servicing. They are a, you know, noxious gas in the cab. It's a danger. Uh, especially so you guys, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of uh, amplified with you guys because it gets trapped in here. The guys in the regular pickups, it's hood and it goes up the wheels. You know, for you guys, it, it especially finds the fireman them. in the back, it just kind of yeah, goes right in their face. It's right yeah. there. So look for real big traces of soot. You're gonna have little bits from things here and there, but as long as it's a, a very light, it's, it's, it's reasonably acceptable. But anything that's a significant soot that you guys think, or even any sense of an odor. Let us know because we need to address something. It sometimes can be as small as a small crack. These things have have sometimes cracking in the loops, the loops here. The fluting, excuse me. The V band clamps is a notorious. Uh, a lot of it will hide in this stuff, uh, heat blanket. So I'll just take a visual and see if you see anything, especially if you smell it or something like that. We need to want to address it right away. Uh, what would you call that? Fluting? Yeah. Fluting. fluting. All right. Fluting. So transmission case, visual leaks on the outside, like I said, this is a vent, so you're going to get, um, the transmission is vented so it doesn't build pressure inside. Uh, if they didn't, they would leak up any possible yeah. point that they can, which usually seals. So this is just a vent for the case. There's a little hole in there with a little pellet. Um, normal, because the vapor, the air vapor with the oil is going to come out and make a big mess. And then while well, you're cleaning, if you're doing cleaning on a truck or anything like that, if you've got anything collecting in these little valleys, just kind of take care of it so it doesn't become a problem. Because then it can mask something that's actually leaking. You know, so sometimes like these plates leak. So you just come down here, your drive shaft right on in here. Make sure that all your fasteners or anything are, are present or not broken or rusted or look like they're backing out. Um, look for, this is one of the places where you kind of want to see greasy oil <laughs> flinging around because that means it's it's getting lubricated and it's just doing its thing that's you're saying that's what you're going to see yeah you'll see grease flinging around here you don't want a big giant globs of it but like this is pretty normal you know you'll see this this is light um but over time as these trucks age because these are pretty new you're gonna get a, not gonna get a lot of it but as they get older you're just gonna see big old streaks of 
right here is oily like grease spots or oil stains in this area because yeah, it's it. spinning at a high velocity so um, it's going to throw that grease wherever it can um, to, but you're going to look for same type of things for indications this is like rusty orange you know something like that or look for the bolts to be backed out but you also want to look make sure that you don't have any kind of cracks developing because these will, will have cracks that happen um, significant seal leakage from here this is the end of the transmission there's a seal back here typically the one unique thing for leaks we can touch on it real quick uh, leaks from power steering or engine most of the time just the motor they're the messiest just the messiest areas typically where the leaks are coming from the ironic part of it is it's anything that's transmission fluid uh, transmission fluid is very detergent so it actually cleans where it's leaking from so typically the cleanest area where you see it coming, that's where the leak's actually yeah. coming from. It actually takes all that stuff off. Some people use ATF to clean parts. So, right. like. so it's a good indication where you might see a leak. If you look at hoses down below, you'll see the transmission hoses. But it's one of the things is you've got a, an upper range you're going to check, and then you kind of go to, back to the front and do an undercarriage. Same thing, go from the front, give yourself a motion, the, however you want, it's capable. Of giving you a pattern that you're comfortable that you'll hit all the points that's what you want to do from the front to back drive lines pump transmission from down below second drive line to the rear end same thing looking for leaks uh, frame pieces bolts from the inside just a visual from inside look something's bolts uh, a witness mark from where a bolt was painted and all of a sudden it's not there and you see the shiny metal spot that with a hex it's gone indicator that you should probably had a fastener that was there is no longer there anymore Stuff like that you can use. Oh, it shouldn't be bare steel. You know, and just carry that on down below for the other to the back of the truck. We can go to the other side now if yeah. you want because there's other components over there. But uh, anytime you're doing a checkout on any of the stuff, we are always more than happy to come out and verify anything that you think might be a concern. We'd rather have the call that I think there's something going on than kind of dismiss it and then it becomes a problem. Rather come out here. There is no. What happened? Uh, pause it. Um, I I did have a question yeah. on, the, on the turbo. Yeah. So on the other turbos, it's the EGR uh, tubing. Is, it's a, it's a it's, or it's, just, it's just color. too much weight. The, the little motor uh, in here is just so struggling. So. So it has to be. I mean, this thing's. I don't know where the hell. Well, that's, um, I don't think that's a target, I think those are burning emissions. No, that is, it's not that they have to have any DR, they have to get rid of a certain emissions uh, criteria. Okay. And how they do it. So they, how they, they do it is up to the name. Death fluid and the DPF. Yeah, you got DPF, you got death, you got death, you got reactors. Okay. EGR was the first thing. Let's get rid of NOx, which is nitrogen oxide. There we go. And so... I was still they recording that, the entire time. Sweet. Some <laughs> back in the About to edit that yeah, out. They did. That's how they dropped that down. So now, as the standards have been essentially, the max is lowered mm -hmm. by raising the standard, the EGR was no longer capable of meeting those standards. So some of the engines went around a different way. So either they kept the EGR or they could get rid of it. How they do it is not what the state cares about. It's the numbers. Okay. So some engines, Cummins so didn't have EGR. So I missed forever. that. This doesn't have an EGR. So so there was two things on here. I was I was I couldn't find the EGR valves like there was on the old on the other engines. Yeah, and some so of these may not. There's not an actual. Well, I gotta verify in this motor. Yeah. It may be we just can't see it because it's integrated into uh, the manifold. Some of the trucks we have, the okay. EGR is actually integrated into the exhaust manifold where it doesn't resemble. A traditional EGR mm. valve. It's built into the assembly, so I have to EPA look. It doesn't care how you do it as long as you have the numbers you have showing the numbers. that there's, there's a say, lower emissions value. Correct. They care about the emissions output of the apparatus. How you go about it, they don't care. Just meet the numbers. So some of these will have it integrated, and so it's not doesn't look like the other trucks. If it has, one, Dodge got away with not having DPF or urea forever because hey, they did it, it all in their engine their programming, their engine uh, formulas and formats, how they did it, 
that they could meet the numbers. And again, that's all the EPA cares about. But at one point, you can't meet it with just manipulating the engine. So I'd have to look at this one, to be honest. I haven't had my hands on it long enough to be able to go really DGR or not. So to be completely honest with you. But there's a possibility I may not have it. But I haven't confirmed that. Um, one of the other components is kind of obvious on this side. Some people may not be aware. Is this is the turbo, a uh, very expensive one. <laughs> Nowadays, they used to be 1200 bucks. Now these are almost pushing $5,000 because they're very high tech. Um, these have variable geometry, which has to do with power and emissions. That isn't really part of anything with the, the, the driver operator. Just has to do with power. I mean, you can go over stuff. just very uh, hot side, cold side. Novice sure. Level, how this turbo works. So we'll go with better basics. The turbo, basically, what it does is a pump that force feeds air into the engine to increase uh, the air for the combustion process. So the turbo is was designed to take advantage of essentially wasted energy. The exhaust coming out of the engine is still energy coming out of heat and velocity pressure from the exhaust so back in the day they had a supercharger the superchargers are a parasitic load they take power to make power so somebody thought outside the box and said well we got all this wasted energy coming out we can harness that and do the same thing and pressurize it there turbo and a supercharger do the exact same thing force feed air into the engine engine under pressure to get rid of um, to complement what we already have is that risk atmospheric pressure. So the little paddle in here is fed by the exhaust pressure and exhaust flow, spins a little wheel, which in turn is connected to another one on this side, which is considered a compressor, even though both wheels look identical. One takes and takes the exhaust and turns it into rotational energy, which turns this paddle wheel, which sucks in air at a height of life pool, creates a negative atmosphere, so the atmospheric pressure pushes the air in through the air filter into here, but then in turn speeds it and ramps it up so high that it actually sends it out under an extreme positive pressure, sometimes at 38, 40, 50 PSI. Your, sends your it, boost, basically. Your boost sends it through here, out the outlet, elbow, the intake tube, to the intercooler, which is on the front of the radiator. Reason for that is when you speed up air like that under friction and force, the air gets heated up. When it heats, it loses that, it loses air density, so you lose power. So if the, hot, the air coming in from the turbo is extremely hot, it makes a lot less power than air that's been cooled down. Thus, we have the giant intercooler, which is hard to see in here, but in front of the grill we'll be able to see it. That it takes, it's an air-to-air -air charge air cooler. It uses air to cool down the air coming from the turbo that goes into the intake on the other side of the engine. So I hope that's uh, good enough, not yeah. too much or not enough. You guys let me know. Like I say I can. I lost. Here I lost all one day. of the boots on mine, and I realized I lost all the power. And I was wondering. I thought my truck was broken down. And I looked back on all of, and I completely blacked out the entire street. Yeah, a good indicator is that you'll get all that stuff. So this is harder because it tries to catch it all, but you lost. Roll, roll lost roll, roll. power. But on these, it's so high you're gonna hear it. You're gonna just a huge hissing noise. It's a good indicator. Usually, this either the clamp failed and the poop came off. Or the actual boot fail. We haven't had too many of the boots actually fail. It's usually the clamp takes a dump. Okay. And so again, make sure it's not wiggly. Look in here. Put your hands on it, especially if it's not hot. If it's hot, be careful. You don't want to burn yourself. But make sure all these components are there. This is uh, a digital indicator. It tells you if the air filter is dirty. It'll tell you on the dash. There's another little plunger in there. Uh, if you're not sure, you can reset it. You're not going to hurt anything. You're not going to. Uh, Inconvenient sauce, but anyway, as soon as you get on the road, go take off. It's gonna tell you where the filter is at. Because not, we can see it in the cab. This is the uh, new uh, Neha alternator, uh, 540 amps. If it's not 570, I think it's 540 amp actually. Uh, brush is pretty high tech, um, new to us, so we'll see how they work. Supposedly they shouldn't have to deal with them very much. Um, from there, uh, make sure. All your hardware is there. It's, it's, looks like it's tight. Make sure your cables and stuff aren't fraying on something. Um, if it is or something, we can come out and address it or we have to do something about it by replacing it or relocating it. Um, from there, you can go to your belt. You can do that from the other side as well, but check 
not only outside but the inside look for a little cracking in the ribs this one on over operations you're gonna see a little bit over time the rubber starts to get hard it'll have a little couple little cracks here and there but if you flip this belt over and it just looks like everything is cracked everywhere call us we'll come out and usually have them on and we'll change them out for you uh, plan blade make sure the fans um, when you turn the ignition off their pressure will release it won't it won't spin just look make sure all the blades are there they're not cracked or broken um, or stuff's on it make sure because it'll all balance the motor it can actually get worse um, again hoses ram same thing on this side leaks stuff like that these and many of our engines have a side glass up here these are a little bit difficult we're going to plan on changing out this with a model that we use it's a lot easier to see because this one it's kind of tough to see as long as your coolant is in that window you should be good once you're out of that window it's probably pretty close to when you're going to have the alarm off going inside the cabin. Um, again, that, if you can see it in there, call it good. You don't have to take the lid off the radiator. Um, the less time and okay. expand if it needs to. And if it needs it, it'll pull it from there when it works properly. So, so this the, this is the reservoir. We don't need to worry about it. Yeah, right now, um, we want you to be at the cooler. temperature. Let's see, it should be in here. But... Um, it should always be in this area. You don't want to be way up here because when this thing does go up to temperature, it can push out and then it'll just puke out on the ground. Okay. So this is, we want to see what it does once you guys run it and it's up to temp. See where it's at and let us know. We'll come top that off for you. Um, apparatus, for some reason, every entity I talk to, it's a chronic thing. It can't stop the leak. I don't know if it's because it's, they're so custom that there's so many points that they can leak and air bubbles over time that they'll never get them. But as long as we don't have drips on the ground, large trails of evidence of a leak, that's where we want to make sure that there's, we don't see something that's an active leak. You know, that's what we want. For the most part, it's almost like a, a controlled leak rate, if you will, for a lack of a better term. But as long as we make sure that's full, you don't have the residue around the cap because if one of many things you're going to leak down there or you'll have this full and that glass up there will be empty and you have this like what it's yes. it's up but that's empty which means probably there's something wrong on the cap so it's not creating the phenomenon or the, the circumstances for it to suck the coolant back into the radiator like needs to. So, can we go back real quick to sure. uh, you're talking about the belt I was yeah. just curious about all the components that are powered by the belt so depending on the apparatus you can have any number of, uh, of components powered by the belt a long time ago the air compressor was also driven by, by the belt but because of the nature of the vehicles you're talking about uh, manufacturers got away with it they didn't want the driver worrying about all of a sudden the belt snapped and you lost your compressor for your brakes yes. so manufacturers you know what the heck with that uh, we're going to drive it directly from the motor, either from the front or from the timing gearbox on the back. And then we're going to put the power steering pump up here. So there's another belt. Most of the apparatus nowadays, even the power steering pump is no longer driven by the belt. It's driven direct by physically engaged gears. To and that's all for the same reason, for just the, the same safety. Reason, so safety, they feel it was just easier, less things to worry about on a commercial truck. You know, um, we've got com passenger vehicles that aren't going to electric because of stuff like that, so controllable. That's what we found, power steering and the generator. Power steering and, uh, and the compressor. The air compressor will be directly driven by the engine. Is this, this is your water pump right there? Underneath this the alternator? This is the water pump right here for this motor. Um, they can vary from left to right. Typically, most of the time, you'll see them on this side. And, um, and even then, those can be driven either by a belt or some of the engine models and brands will be driven mechanically through the gear pump. The engine itself. So again, check your belt. Like this is a pulley that can do two things, but it's not being used. So back tape to the original it, statement. Right there. On average, the belt-driven components are going to be AC yeah, compressor pumps. Piece. Yeah. The compressor, excuse me. The cooling fan, the alternator, um, and maybe an idler pulley here uh, and there. Which cooling fan? Mm -hmm. It'll be the main engine, the cooling fan itself. Will be belt driven. Perfect. No. Well, there is a belt right Yeah, there's two belts. Usually it comes up from the bottom, drives that one. Then in turn, that belt will drive the uh, alternator 
for the uh, air, com air conditioning compressor on the other side. Some trucks have two. Some of our apparatus have dual alternators. So, um, unfortunately, when that belt goes, you lose both. Figure that. <laughs> Engineering out. Uh, you would think you'd have two belts, but they don't. Uh, so, the one phenomenon with most commercial trucks now is the fan has a, referred to as an air clutch. It physically, what it does, it's designed for fuel economy. Uh, they have it, and you'll hear it on newer trucks. You're driving on the road, and then you just hear engine noise, and then you're hearing this big roar just whoo, of the fan, because what they're doing is, if the, the travel speed of the vehicle is enough to get air through the radiator, they'll kick the fan out, so it's just that, instead of having that drag and power loss and more fuel being used on the road. Just increasing your fuel economy. So basically what it is, for us, We'd rather have them engaged all the time because we'd rather have, you have cooling for the truck than uh, obviously we want fuel economy, but I'll trade letting the truck cool down better than fuel economy if we have to. But when it's working good, it's actually a good system when it works good. And so what happens is um, this little gauge, you'll hear a little whistle that dumps the air. The default for the fan clutch is you lose air, it will default engaged, not the other way around. So it takes air to release it so it free wheels. But when it loses the air, it'll lock oh, together. Got a call. It's default. So you will default to cool. Okay, do this. Sure. You got a hit? Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, Victor. No problem. Hopefully we catch you again. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no worries. Thank, Thank you, Victor. Thank right. you so yeah. much. Stuff. No how problem. I, how do I turn this thing off? Let's... So it's still recording. Okay. So it's just that little red button. Okay. And you can just kind of like wield it and go right. through it. Okay. All right. Oh, oh, these are you guys. All right. Excuse me, Victor. <laughs> Just the main views. Where do you leave off and where are you continuing to uh, From retire? here, it's coming down the side okay. of the motor. We did all these components. Okay. Uh, basically, it's the same hoses, lines, cables, anything like that. It could be having any kind of issue uh, leaking. Uh, these are uh, communication electrical wires coming in the cab. But you also have air conditioning lines coming in through here. Make sure they're not rubbing or hitting something or if they're leaking, you know. This is the receiver dryer for the AC. Um, not the greatest spot, in my opinion, because it's the first one to take a hit. But it, we'll wait to see. We'll see what happens. And so, okay. but from here, on the upper side, same things on the other side, high calling. Taking a view of tires, lug nuts, oil level, condition of the rim, tire tread, any damages like that tread okay. measurement brake components suspension steering make sure all those components look be tight loose not rubbing or crack broken or, or cracked and carrying on that motion of coming back to the truck and make sure you hit all your components okay. same thing again torsion bars here again avoid stepping or standing on it or using it for a uh, anchor point because it's a nice round piece of metal that's very appealing to that but uh, for anything that might damage the coating it can intrude moisture and cause rust this is your other bank of batteries, same thing. Look at your cables, just give it a little wiggle, make sure that it is clean before you do so. And uh, if it isn't and there's a lot of corrosion, uh, notify SOP so we can remediate that because that's something going on there. Uh, just wiggle the wires as long as they don't move, they should be good to go. The cab lock again, make sure there's not a bunch of leaking coming in there. Drive shafts on the side going to the underside of the truck. Carrying that on, and you, the only difference from here and this side on this truck is um, this has a lot more components to the exhaust with the addition of the, the urea reactor, the injection point, uh, the DPF system. Um, get underneath, you'll see a big snorkel tube of components that come back around and up and over. Make sure you don't have a bunch of any leaking or anything dripping on that stuff, that could be a problem. And if it is, contact shop me. Okay. You can look at the underside of the cab, any kind of damage, uh, cab lock, something loose up there, any kind of uh, something like a failure or cracking in the structure, the hole. Uh, this is a pretty common up here. Uh, this is the cooling lines that go up to the heater for the firefighter in the back and in the front cab area. This is where it comes in. This is two clamps that could potentially be a coolant leak area. Just look for that. This is a, a, an older issue that we addressed already. It's just a dried up residual from it. But that's an example of, on this particular vehicle, what the dried up 
uh, coolant crust would look like to look in any other areas of the engine that potentially be a source for a leak. That's a good one that will tell you what to look for. Okay. Um, air filter, make sure it's intact, mount is secure. Same thing, it's, make sure it's not falling off. These are kind of wiggly from the factory. That's something we've addressed with the manufacturer. Uh, make sure that the filter looks intact in there and doesn't have a hole. Uh, we do try to use uh, fire retardant filters, but uh, still want to make sure that the media itself is intact. So. Okay. Uh, coming down the bottom, do your undercarriage, same thing as before. Yeah. From this side, components damaged, body damage, uh, missing components, leaks, uh, lighting, door components. We'll, we'll talk later. <laughs> um, Exhaust, make sure that's not smashed. If it is, we want to make sure that that's addressed. We'll replace it. Um, lighting, handles, uh, make sure all your doors will lock and secure. Um, simply just open it, close it. Um, same thing on this side tire drip damage. There's a pretty good example right here of a slight damage to the tire, which isn't really much of a concern. You can see it's pretty limited to the lug itself doesn't appear to go anywhere deeper. Um, I could take a pen or anything like that and peel it back and then take the point and make sure I can run in there. It's like, oh yes, see this clearly does not protrude past this cut here. It's right here. Uh, so there's no danger of that hitting cord. In the tread area, same thing as the side. If you put a device or a screwdriver that's not sharp or anything like that, you cannot feel the cord feel cord it's an out of service but it's a pretty good example of pretty common damage for the tire tread that isn't a concern you do want to check it thoroughly to make sure uh, this would be something that you wouldn't even need to call us because it's obviously it's, it doesn't go anywhere okay. but if it's questionable where it's down to the surface um, and you're not sure call us we'll come out and verify it for you always call same thing through here tread Try separate three separate points of points to measure the tread depth. Same thing on the inner. Again, stress inner duel is the one that will wear the most. Is the most common one that will uh, isn't used to be not caught very much, but more is not very common nowadays. Guys are doing a pretty good job um, of checking the tread from the inner, uh, and this is the one that will wear the most. But while you're here, make sure that you get your hand. Check between the duels because you can pick up a rock or some kind of foreign debris. Um, it could uh, cause the one damage to the tire, but the potential is that you could actually fling it when the truck actually ejects it. You could hit a, a vehicle behind you or something like that. Um, when you're there, springs, spring hangers. This is pretty normal. It's residual uh, grease. This is the moisture from the grease itself. Make sure that these things are intact. The spring isn't broken or cracked. Uh, bolts carry on to the front and look for the front spring hanger up here uh, Check that all the springs are intact cracking or missing um, Anything like that. This is the hanger in the front Locking pin is there. This is all residual grease residue, which is normal You want that you don't want it to be bone dry because that means it hasn't gotten lubricated uh, Check all the fasteners make sure they have no indications of being loose or rust or missing or broken and any cracking stuff like that uh, look between the on this apparatus especially just take a glance between above the frame make sure there's not going on the structure that supports the water tank fasteners uh, the surface between the uh, bracketry and the, the frame itself especially with the apparatus is a very prone place to have water moisture trap make sure that this doesn't have what's uh what's called as rust jacking where Rust is like a kind of like a uh, the rust cancer you see that bubbles up. What happens? The moisture gets trapped in here and starts to grow. The rust will grow, and you'll see start seeing the metal deform, kind of start bulging. And now it's called a rust jacking, and that, that's a, a pretty bad problem. That has to be addressed right away. It usually results in having us to replace or uh, repair that area and address it. Um, <laughs> As we come back, uh, which mostly part of the undercarriage, you're going to come in and look at all the points where you see the connection points for the filler necks for the fuel. Make sure you don't have uh, active leaking. 
you will have similar to this uh, a moistness it's just kind of collected dirt that's pretty normal here but as long as it's not wet or dripping again it falls under the criteria of a fuel leak on an apparatus if it's got a drip it's an auto service issue we have to address it immediately this you can see from underneath you'll be able to seat up this uh pathway where this hose connects out to the the door that connects the filler neck here that goes all the way through there you want to try and eyeball it through there if you can to make sure you don't have that again moisture like here this is normal just from the normal day-to-day -day operations uh, make sure your cap's there physically <laughs> and it's tight you don't have to wrench it on but you do want it to be snug to make sure that when you're driving it doesn't slosh around and leak that's pretty good that's all it takes and keep anything from when you fill it up make sure that that seals there and then uh, if I have any loose stuff you might drop something in that thing you've seen it not from <laughs> our department but other departments have dropped stuff in there and, um, not really a too big deal but you want to avoid it <laughs> Good call. <laughs> Lesson for the day. Yeah. Uh, do make sure your mud flaps are intact. They do serve a purpose to prevent debris from this locked in the charge drive right, being flung back. Uh, it can damage our vehicle, but uh, you want to make sure that they're there because they'll deflect any debris that's being flung by a tire for oncoming cars that are flying behind the apparatus. If it's there, let us know. We'll order one immediately and get it replaced. Things. All right. Uh, while we have the cab up, uh, let me go on the other side. Why don't you just? Yeah, you said side. Just point. So let's point some uh, pump stuff out. Some comp some uh, components that you see right. That you know, just major components that you may see right away. And so uh, I'm trying to think. Of this is a good spot to be. We'll try it. So one of the things that a common question for I get is. How can you tell what part of the pump does what? So for the most part, the biggest one is anything above, when you can kind of glance to the outside, from the large six inch intake down, anything for the most part is typically an intake. Um, unless it's an auxiliary discharge, it's clearly labeled as such. Because you will have stuff that's plumbed from the top down. But for the most part, from the center line of the eye of the impeller, which is just above to the suction that is all part of the intake system of the pump anything above that especially plumb directly to the housing all that is going to be discharged just automatically nothing above that point will be have anything to do with an intake so basically you can see the intake of the pump anything above that is automatically a discharge port so that's a pretty common thing that i get we have some nice hand wheels on these new uh, engines that we got that are pretty pretty nice but you, all the discharges will range from a three inch here to two and a half here down uh, looks like the two inch here uh, and so forth nowadays it's nice as most of these components are stainless but you do want to look at uh, most on all our apparatus just as a routine habit just look for leaking look for leaks here at seams here gaskets end plates cover plates uh, the handle the valve shaft here there could be a leak there look for water leaks in those components not just from a leak that's charging a line that's not being used because that still means that there's something going on the seal inside the valve is leaking through the shaft which means the o-ring is, de is defective good indicator is really that valve starts to become tough to open you get the calcification and mineral deposits on there and it causes it to, to stiffen up uh, one thing that if trucks start to get clean, we want to avoid uh, any sort of pressure washing into these areas because all these new apparatus nowadays have a multitude of uh, many computers are called modules or nodes, um, anywhere from a dozen to 40. <laughs> and they're uh, pretty sophisticated, complicated to work on, um, and in many cases are not it's cheap. Um, and it takes having to send components back to the manufacturer, have them uh, pull the information out of it and upload it in their system to configure the new one and then download information to the new module and then get it sent back, which could take a month sometimes, uh, depending. Okay. So just avoid it. 
water and electric, bad idea. <laughs> you know, so just a good rule of thumb okay. to do that. Um, see what other kind of stuff. What's this right, right here, Victor, right here in front? This one. I'm trying to remember is the, this should be the pump for the uh, oil. Excuse me. The pump for the foam. Okay. It's basically hydraulically driven. Okay. You engage the pump from the, uh, when you are in pump for the water, you can turn on the, when these operate, it's Husky 10. Uh, three. Uh, Husky 3. Mm -hmm. This one's the 3. The 3? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. How much the 10 it is the caps is the 9? Yeah. Okay. We still haven't gotten our hands on these very much <laughs> to play with them. So this is a hydraulically activated pump to inject the foam into the discharges that have been selected for foam. So this here, you'll have hydraulic lines of these here. And then um, this should be the feed for the foam, I believe. And then, discharges so this is the hydraulic lines here excuse me this actually runs the pump it's basically two pistons that work back and forth and this operates the ram and in turn plunges and, and injects the oil so hydraulics and in turn pushes the plungers and then on the other side here this is the manifold for the foam that goes and just sends it to where it needs it to go um, i haven't physically broken one apart yet so <laughs> Very good. Once I do that, I can give okay. you better details. So. Um, let's come back here on this side. Yeah. Let's just uh, <clears throat> try to make sure that we, not more so of a pre trip just and talk, but more of just a, a point and this, a point identifier. This is this, this is this. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can uh, maybe start. Back. Okay. Just follow the camera. Start back with the. I guess we'll start with the air dryer and okay. just just like a. So component location and I, I basically identifying components. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got simple simple it down. This would be the air dryer mm -hmm. for the air system to remove moisture. Battery bank. Cab lift pump and hydraulics down here. These here are your uh, in case there's a dead battery condition for some reason. Uh, you're out somewhere and. and batteries take a dump we can pull these little caps here okay. and uh, the truck can be jump started which is something that we would come out and do okay. we have a larger system to do that regular car may not do that okay. so um, this is a, a isolator it's a smaller component not all our trucks have it but it's for charging different components and that whole thing okay. so this would be uh, the front discharge uh, torsion bar for this, this type of suspension Control arms, upper and lower uh, steering uh, tie rod here, which is just part of the steering linkage to simplify it. Okay. This does have a shock absorber. It's kind of tough to see, but then it does have a shock, much like a conventional car. It's just big in here. Uh, power steering and reservoir, trans uh, transmission, lipsticks and fill tubes for the engine oil and transmission. Obviously, the engine, fuel filter for the engine itself. Um, this is basically the intake manifold. This is some of the, the, the emissions components. I'd have to double check what exactly this thing done. Because again, I haven't had my hands on it very long. Uh, this is the main computer, or CPC or ECM, depending on who you talk to for this particular engine. Uh, again, once you clean a truck, we don't want to pressure wash the areas with the motors anymore. Uh, okay. This is a very sensitive piece of, of equipment on the truck. Uh, governor for the air system that regulates right. cut in and cut out. Okay. Air compressor for it. Intake tube for the air coming into the air compressor for the air brakes. Okay. AC compressor and pulley. AC bolt. This would be the intake final coming from the air cooler to the engine. Safety prop for the cab. Cab lift cylinder and hydraulic ramp for lifting the cab. Uh, down here, which we didn't touch on before, this is the bottom of what would be the foot valve, which is for basically your brake pedal. This is where the air from the air tanks comes in. You hit the pedal and disperses the air to the front and rear brake system. Uh, these are all the little sensors for brake lights and low air warnings. So main engine harness, spaghetti <laughs> from the, these trucks nowadays. Uh, steering miter box for change of direction for your steering linkage. Uh, this is the actual steering shaft that goes from the steering column down, follow it down to the steering gear boxes, which are in here. Kind of tough to see unless you get in there. 
we have duals we have a uh, master or main gearbox if you will and an auxiliary gearbox which is uh, an assist for there's a lot of uh, a lot of stress on the front end that needs to steer properly so it uses two of them uh, lower control arm again and it mounts um, oil pan area keep an eye out for oil leaks and stuff like that uh, front cross member which is basically the support for the cab lift mechanism radiator front of the engine Stuff? Yeah. Thank you. Simple. Yeah. <laughs> easier to see on this side. Uh, upper radiator hose leading to the top of the radiator. Uh, good prone area for checking for leaks. Um, this hose here is also part of the cooling system, but what this does and the other hose next to it here. Um, are for the indirect cooler that when you're in pumping operations if you're starting to get a little warm uh, you can turn it on and it'll help cool the engine down during uh, especially hotter times of the year it'll help keep the engine cool um, main engine cooling fan uh, made of plastic so keep an eye out for that make sure it doesn't break or split basically the back face of the radiator in that area look in there for cooling leaks uh, alternator water pump on this particular engine is here uh, cooling fan clutch and pin here um, you can see there uh, there's a big bearing pulley here a couple of idlers were basically the tensioners for the belt there's no longer a manual adjustment it's all done by spring so we keep an eye out you see that thing here making noise and we got to do something about that there um, this is where the water the cooling the coolant coming from the radiator is coming into the engine from this lower hoses comes up through this pipe under the engine again these are all uh, bypass lines for coolers or for the engine was really cooler the points for it to leave or return uh, is where they do all that tying in again second uh, cab lift cylinder for raising the cab uh, anchor point here this is just uh, looks like the little seal for the grease in there uh, we'll take a look at that but this is just a little rubber disc it's not anything as far as a bushing or anything like that leaks here up the point of where it connects to the cab come down this this is the mount for the radiator that big piece here this is actually the main cab pivot where the cab is attached there's a lot of stress and force going on there that's why it's pretty beefy as you can tell um, more electrical spaghetti coming down from the cab ac line connections uh, come on come on. component for the ac is just a receiver dryer and stuff disappearing into the frame <laughs> Here from there, this is the main primary side of the intake, air filter, come to the intake the turbo, turbo itself here, uh, air coming in from here, coming out under pressure, back into the cooler, which is easier seen by the front of the engine, but that's where the uh, intercooler or charger filler happens to be. Uh, radiator in this area, it's kind of covered by a bunch of stuff, but the main piece of that is the radiator uh, up there, sight glass. And then um, the exhaust side with possibly the EGR manifold. And then this actually has the EGR because this is the EGR cooler. So it's it's hiding in there somewhere. I just can't see the actual physical EGR valve. I have to find it. But this is the EGR cooler. Uh, you may see coolant leaks or exhaust coming out of this guy. Okay. Uh, uh, before, fluid checkpoints. Exhaust pipe coming from the turbo down to the after treatment devices. So this is the blanket Try avoid really messing with this guy. You're gonna get that fire glass all over you be itchy Nobody likes that uh, Right side passenger side bank batteries again suspension control arm Tie rods steering linkages the drag uh, center link door control arm spindle and hub uh, in there Again, the passenger side portion bar again, avoid stepping, prying, anchoring, anything from that bad boy. Okay. And so forth. This side, cab locks from this side, okay. torsion bar, uh, arm, they call it, for setting ride height from the spring rate. Okay. Uh, this yeah. linkage is right here because all associated with setting the torsion bar and the strut rod there. And underneath the cab, you see this is the first part of the exhaust, which is this is probably going to be the I believe is the DPF or the particle trap which hatches all the soot and does the regen and then we go on the other side and follow it over the uh, muffler and 
urea reactor or component is on the other side. Okay. Can you just talk real quick about the engine, cooler, and recirculating line? Just sure. to... The oh. um, first part is you have the auxiliary engine cooler, which is uh, helps cool the engine down in case uh, the surrounding area is hot, the radiator is just not cutting it, not getting the engine temperatures maintained. You can crack this valve here, which is the engine cooler, so just, and open that to circulate pump water on the discharge through the inductor oh, to so back to the tank. Okay. So, Dude. <laughs> All right, Victor. Thanks so much for Not coming out. Not a problem. All right. My pleasure. We'll, we'll call you when we need you. We'll do. <laughs> All right, All right. guys.